Hi everyone, how are you? Welcome to our ugly holiday sweater tasting. My name is Lauren, I'll be your host for tonight. Hopefully some of you have noticed that you are able to turn on your camera and you're able to unmute yourself. So we're trying to make it a little bit more interactive for you moving forward. Feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions Thank at the you. end. And if you don't mind, keep muted throughout the experience so that way it's quiet for everyone. <laughs> Love that everyone's cameras are on. If you have your ugly holiday sweater, go ahead and throw it on. I have my vest on. I know Mark dressed up a bit as well. So we're ready to kick off the holiday season with you. Make sure you have your tasting mat in front of you, your chocolates, a drink of choice, water, wine, beer, juice, milk, anything like that. Here, All right, we'll wait just a minute or so to get started. And then again, if you can mute yourself, if you don't have a question, that way it'll be quiet for everyone and we can all hear Mark okay. And I think we can go ahead and get started shortly. All right, so I will go ahead and introduce a little bit about our company. Um, if, one second. If you all are ready and you have your tasting mat in front of you, and I'll mute yourself really quick, I will go ahead and get started. And Priscilla, can you help to mute people? Yeah, I, mute hear, I, hear a little bit people. I hear a little bit of an echo. All right. So if any of you, actually, I would love to know if any of you have done our tastings before. This has our first one since our holiday lighting ceremony. So it's about a month ago. If you want to use the chat box and type in if you've done a tasting before, when it was, or if this is your first one, welcome. Happy to have you here with us. I'll talk a little bit about our company, and then I will introduce Mark, and he will walk you through your tasting and your chocolates that you have in front of you. So... Our company, Ethel M. Chocolates, was founded by Forrest Mars Sr. And the way that the Mars company started is, how, is his father, Frank, started making chocolate and started the Mars company in 1911. Years later, Forrest joined him and together they produced the products uh, M&Ms, Twix, Milky Way, Snickers, and fun fact, Snickers is actually one of the best selling candy bars in the world, so it's pretty special. Forrest retired from the Mars Family Company and moved to Henderson, Nevada for a little bit of a warmer climate and just to relax out here. A few years later, he got that retirement itch where he wanted to start working again and get back into confectionery. So he started making chocolate again using his mother Ethel's recipes, these same ones that date back to 1911 when they started the Mars Company. So he built his factory and in 1981, it opened. And you'll see in that top middle photo is our factory. We actually have, if you see in the back of that top middle photo, there's a little balcony and Forrest lived above the factory while he was here just to kind of make sure that the standards were good and all the product was up to what he was looking for. And we actually still have some of his original decor still up there, which is pretty special. You'll see in that top photo as well is the Las Vegas Strip. So we are just about 15 minutes away from the Strip. If you're coming out to Vegas anytime, it's really beautiful in the spring and the winter is probably our cactus garden's prettiest time. In the spring, everything is in bloom. And then in the winter, we decorate the entire garden with over a million and a half lights and we turn it into a really pretty winter wonderland. So it's very special to see. And you can see in the bottom middle photo is a photo of our cactus covered in lights. The last thing I want to touch on is our solar panel garden, which is that bottom left photo. And it's actually right behind our cactus garden. It's 4.4 acres of solar panels. And that produces enough energy to power our factory during its peak production hours. So it is completely run off of solar power. I'll go ahead and introduce Mark, who will host your tasting tonight. Mark Mackey is our product development manager and chief chocolatier for Ethelum Chocolates. So that means he creates and innovates all the pieces that we have. His most recent projects are the cognac truffle, the holiday fudge, 
and the five piece holiday samplers stand in front of you tonight. He also graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in New York and currently lives in Las Vegas, Nevada. Take it away, Mark. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay, right? Great. Um, my name is Mark Mackey, and I'm really excited to be with all of you again tonight. For those of you that this is your first time, um, welcome. And for those repeat guests, um, hope you have a wonderful experience as well with some of our new holiday pieces that are limited to the um, holiday season only. Um, so I think let's go ahead and get started. And <clears throat> tonight what I want to do is I want us to really slow down when we're eating our chocolate. We really want to taste everything. I like to close my eyes actually um, when I'm tasting chocolate, but we really want to use all of our senses to truly evaluate each piece of chocolate from picking it up and looking at it. What is the color? Do we see any variation? Do we see any, any garnish or any um, decoration on the piece? Smell. We want to actually pick the piece up, bring it up to your nose and breathe in really deep. It's really important that you get a really nice um, aroma or an actual smell of the piece before you taste it. Because many of you know, um, a lot of what you taste and what you perceive uh, as flavor in your mouth is actually uh, experienced through your olfactory senses um, in your nose. So if you know if you've ever been sick or had a cold and your nose or um, sinuses have been stuffed up, you probably haven't been able to taste very well. Um, and that's because um, of those olfactory senses in your nose. So just like we do with wine, you know, we want to smell the piece um, and then obviously taste. So we're going to be picking it up, tasting it, really looking at or experiencing the texture. Is it smooth? Is it creamy? <clears throat> How is it melting? What is the aftertaste or the linger, um, the lingering flavors? All of those things we will be considering tonight. Um, hopefully you all have your placemat in front of you. You'll notice we have spots on the placemat to actually capture some notes for each sensory attribute. And then if you'll notice also on the lower left-hand side, there's a wheel there and you can also see it in the slideshow. Um, and this has really all of the different aromas and flavors um, and categories and then the specific notes that we'll be experiencing tonight. Um, and so when you're, when you're tasting and maybe you think of something or you're like, okay, that tastes like something or like a fruity note or a dairy note. And if there's something that you can't maybe perceive or put your finger on, look down at the wheel because it's very likely that that um, will be um, illustrated on, on that wheel. So you, if it's on the tip of your tongue, you'll probably be able to pick up on it. Um, that way. And then finally, you know, everybody's tastes are very different. So if you're with your friends and family next to you, um, you know, everybody's going to be tasting things a little differently. And so don't be afraid to um, mention to them or even to us, you know, if there's something a little different that you're tasting. Um, I always love to hear that. It really helps make the experience a lot more enjoyable. Um, and then finally, you know, we have on each page um, some beer and wine recommendations or pairings, completely optional. Um, but if you do like to enjoy those types of beverages, I find that they can actually complement the chocolate quite nicely. And if you're wondering, you know, what kind of um, wine or beer to select, you know, I said we do have those recommendations on each slide. But if you want one thing or two things, it's going to really work well with all of the chocolates. I would recommend something like a juicy or jammy Pinot Noir that really works with with most all chocolates. Um, and then on the beer side, something kind of like an Irish stout, um, like a Guinness or even um, like a porter, um, something like uh, this vanilla porter is quite nice as well. This is from Breckenridge Brewery, um, but otherwise we'll have some specific pairings on each page as well. And with pairing, you know, I think one of the most important things is that, you know, it's um, sharing the stage with the chocolate. It's not overpowering it. Um, you know, it's not kind of cowering to the flavor of the chocolate, but it's really sharing the stage and it's uh, matching the intensity of the beverage with the intensity of the chocolate. All right. So why don't we go ahead and get started with our first piece. Everybody pick up your white chocolate peppermint silk piece right here. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at the appearance. So you'll notice this is a white chocolate piece. You can see 
on the bottom there. And then there's a really nice red kind of glossy sheen. This is actually achieved through colored cocoa butter. So co we'll go into this in a, in a little bit, but cocoa butter is actually the, the fat that comes from the cocoa bean. And so we take that and we actually color it and um, we use an airbrush and we actually pour that colored cocoa butter into the airbrush and we spray all of our molds. And so you'll see some of the pieces tonight will have different colored designs and that's all achieved through colored cocoa butter that we actually will be spraying onto, onto those molds. So in this case, it's a beautiful red glossy appearance there from that red colored cocoa butter. Now let's go ahead and pick it up and bring it up to our nose. And what I like to do is actually kind of rub the bottom or the side of the piece. And that's going to start to soften the chocolate and kind of activate some of those aroma compounds. Kind of breathe in really nice and deep. You should be getting some of those nice peppermint aromas, a little bit of dairy like cream or butter. And being that this is a white chocolate piece, we're not gonna get really much of what you would consider like a chocolate-like aroma or flavor. And that's because it's made with cocoa butter um, or white chocolate, which is made from cocoa butter, um, which doesn't have any of those cocoa solids. And the cocoa solids are really what give us that, that aromatic um, cocoa or roasted cocoa notes and some of those flavors like you, know, you would correlate with, with chocolate. All right, let's go ahead and take a bite. And what I like to do is take a bite in half and then kind of chew and press the piece up against the roof of your mouth with your tongue. And that'll start to kind of get everything melting. Um, and we can talk about the flavor and then you'll have a second half that you can actually try with your pairing if you'd like. All right, so let's go ahead and try. Notice that beautiful peppermint ganache there on the inside white chocolate shell. So right away, you're gonna be tasting creamy mint coming through, some more dairy, maybe a little bit of butter. Cream and butter, as I mentioned, maybe a little bit of, of caramelization, just a really small hint of caramelized sugar maybe. So when we make this piece, we're actually gonna start off with a traditional chocolate ganache, which is really just a fancy word for an emulsion of chocolate and cream. So in this case, we're gonna use white chocolate. We're gonna heat up our cream to just below boiling, and we're gonna pour that over our tempered white chocolate. And that's gonna to melt together really nice and beautifully. Everything's gonna come down, start melting together nicely. Then we're gonna blend that and create that emulsion of um, the cream and the chocolate and start to form our ganache. And at that point, we're gonna add in our natural um, peppermint oil. We'll add in some, a little bit of softened butter and a touch of salt. It's actually gonna help to enhance um, some of those flavors that we're experiencing. <clears throat> so now if you think about kind of the piece is gone or you can actually kind of taste some of that mint, that creamy mint that's kind of remaining on your tongue. Did anybody get any of that, that caramel? Um, so if, if you did, that's, that's really, really good. That actually, that hint of caramel is actually coming from the cream. Um, once we heat that up to above boiling, uh, some of the milk sugars in the cream will actually start to caramelize just slightly, uh, but it can impart just a really slight caramel or butterscotch note into um, that, that peppermint ganache. Now pairing with this piece, um, again, that uh, vanilla stout or porter that I shared from Breckenridge Brewery, that works really, really nicely. Uh, and also in terms of wine, Pinot Noir, um, Brachetto de Acqui is a really nice sparkling red wine from Italy. Um, it's also very low in alcohol um, for wines. It's about 7%, but it's, it's great with, with most chocolate, but especially milk and um, white chocolate or a Chardonnay or a Chenin Blanc, which is one of my favorites. So if you have your beverage, go ahead and take another, maybe take a bite of the chocolate, another, <clears throat> or a sip of your, your beverage. And what I like to do is kind of close my eyes and really think about 
how the flavors are kind of changing and evolving um, in my mouth. How is it being complemented? How is it being contrasted? Um, hopefully, you know, nothing is really overpowering or, or kind of, um, you know, cutting into um, the others, like shining flavors. All right, so while you're doing that and kind of enjoying that piece, I'm gonna spend a few minutes here just to chat with you a little bit about where chocolate comes from. Um, and we actually split the process up across a few slides. So um, we'll do the first half now and then we'll taste some more chocolate and then we'll come back and finish the process um, a little bit later. <clears throat> All right, so chocolate. All chocolate, this real chocolate, comes from a cocoa pod. And the cocoa pod is actually the fruit of the cocoa plant or cocoa tree. And cocoa only grows in very specific areas of the world. It really needs a fairly tropical environment in which to thrive and to actually grow well. Um, and that is about 20 degrees north and south of the equator. In fact, um, a lot of, you know, cocoa really grows best when it's in the canopy of the rainforest. So you have some very tall trees that provide that canopy and the cocoa kind of sits below and is partially shaded. But a lot of that moisture um, is trapped, which, which cocoa, um, you know, really needs to, to, to dwell and, and to grow um, and yield a, um, a good harvest. Now, <clears throat> something as well, uh, was actually, so ethyl M chocolate, by the way, while we're on the slide, you know, ethyl M chocolates, contain actually a blend of beans. So there are a few different, what I would say macro types or varieties of cocoa. And then um, overall, I would say there's probably about 10 to 15 more micro varietals. Uh, and those grow in different regions like South America, you see there in Latin America, Mexico, the Ivory Coast, West Africa, Ecuador, um, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, um, and just like wine, you know, you can grow the same type of cocoa in different countries or in different regions, and you're going to have a different flavor. And that's um, one reason for that is something called terroir. So just like if you grow Cabernet in California and you try to grow it in France or in Italy, it's going to taste a little bit different because of the environmental conditions or the terroir in which it grows. So things like the soil, the weather, um, you know, things like that, the actual natural yeasts in the air, you know, there are all those things that contribute to the flavor of the finished cocoa. And one thing about cocoa as well, being that it is the fruit of the cocoa tree is that it will grow onto, um, on that tree and it will grow on the branches, but also on the trunk of the tree as well, which we'll see in the next, uh, next slide. <clears throat> But you'll see there the, the photo actually shows cocoa growing on the trunk. So it's really kind of unique. It's something is pretty, um, pretty unique in, 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 that, um, in that realm, I guess. You know, you don't normally see oranges or apples or lemons growing on, on the trunk of the tree. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, the, the pods themselves actually have to be hand harvested. Um, they will eventually fall from the tree, but at that point, they're really unusable. And so the farmer actually needs to cut them down when they're at their peak ripeness. And here I've actually got, this is a fresh cocoa pod that's actually from Ecuador. It's the Nacional variety. And I'm actually going to go ahead and cut into this one with you guys right now. So I don't have a machete here, but I do have just a regular kitchen knife. And I'm going to open this up when you. It looks really weird, doesn't it? It doesn't look anything like chocolate, right? So this is, these are cocoa beans. So these are actually what chocolate comes from. You can see that really thick husk here on the outside that's protecting those those cocoa beans, you get a lot of insects that try to burrow in there, a lot of birds and monkeys that try to get in there and get those, get those cocoa beans because they're actually covered by this really sweet and acidic pulp. It doesn't look a lot like chocolate here. I just pulled one, one out of here. But you kind of see that, that pulp there on the outside of the bean. So as I said, this has a flavor, it's acidic, it's a little bit sweet. 
It kind of tastes like a lychee and a pineapple, kind of a mixture of those two, um, <clears throat> of those two ingredients. But, um, you know, apart from being, you know, pretty delicious to, to critters, it actually also serves a very important purpose. And that is to help aid in fermentation, which is the next step in the process. So fermentation is of paramount importance to um, chocolate making because it is going to allow for the development of the nuances, fruity and floral notes, and a lot of those really unique characteristics that are found in chocolate. And so just like when you ferment sugar into alcohol and you're developing delicious flavors along the way, we're going to do the same thing with our cocoa. Um, so we're going to, the farmer's going to open up all of his pods, he's going to scoop out all of those beans, and then they're going to start that fermentation process. And that's going to take about five to seven days. And you're going to notice the, the beans are going to turn from a white color to kind of like that, that brown color as some of the pulp starts to evaporate off and that fermentation process starts. Um, we're actually going to generate a lot of heat in this process. A lot of that sugar is going to be broken down by bacteria and yeast, um, and that fermentation is going to continue to occur. And they're going to blend those beans, um, get a really nice even mix so that um, we get a nice even fermentation throughout. And then about seven days later, then the beans are done. They've been fermented and they're ready to dry. And then they're basically just going to place them onto a wooden table with some circulation of air and make sure we get those beans dried out um, completely before we are um, before we inspect them um, to be shipped to us in the United States. But at this point, there's still really no what we consider a chocolate flavor, um, you know, and so we're although we are adding a lot of really interesting nuances and flavor, um, they don't actually translate into chocolate until we roast them, which is a little later. So we'll go ahead and leave our beans there and let them kind of hang out for a little bit. And why don't we jump back to our next piece of chocolate. Pick up this piece here. This is our white chocolate pumpkin pie, pumpkin spice pumpkin pie piece. So the first thing you'll notice here, um, apart from the more of like a diamond type shape, uh, this is obviously a, another white chocolate piece. You see that from the bottom. But the top has a really beautiful orange and a little red speckle of that colored cocoa butter to kind of signify the, the pumpkin flavor that's inside. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and kind of rub the bottom a little bit again. Bring it up to your nose. Kind of breathe in. So you're not going to smell obviously any mint this time. You should get some of those dairy notes. Cream vanilla. Can you guys smell any of the pumpkin? I don't smell too much right now, but I will in a moment. So let's go ahead and take a bite. See that pumpkin pie ganache on the inside. White chocolate shell. Again, kind of use your tongue and press it up against the roof of your mouth going to start that ganache, it's going to start melting. You should be getting a lot of spices right now, cinnamon, clove, little nutmeg, allspice. Then you're going to taste a little bit of more like a chocolate, a chocolate essence or roasted cocoa. Kind of rub again, keep going. And now the white chocolate's going to kind of melt and it's going to come in and add a little bit of sweetness and cut some of that spice note. Add some creaminess, some vanilla. So this piece starts out <clears throat> actually with a similar ganache than to how we made the, um, the white chocolate ganache, but this piece actually has some milk chocolate in it, in, in, in the ganache. So we're gonna heat up that, that cream. We're gonna pour it over um, white chocolate mixed in with some milk chocolate. Gonna form that delicious ganache. And now we're gonna add in our pumpkin. So we're going to add in pumpkin puree along with spices, cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, and kind of blend in and create that really delicious ganache. 
And then we're gonna cool it down to about body temperature. We'll add our softened butter and just a little bit of vanilla extract to that ganache and then it's ready to go. And we'll take that and actually mold it in the center of our white chocolate. And that completes the piece. <clears throat> now, in terms of pairing with this piece, we have like a milk stout or a pumpkin ale, you know, something that has maybe a little bit of spice to it. Um, another beer that I think that works um, pretty well is something like a Saison or a Belgian. You know, typically there's a little bit of like um, black pepper or spice in, 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 those, um, in those types of beers that I think can really lend themselves well to a piece like this. Right. Um, and then with wine, really, you know, with, with white chocolate, pretty much the same wines that we had with the mint piece or the white chocolate mint piece as well. The Pinot Noir, the Brachetto, or the Chardonnay or Chenin Blanc. Okay, take a sip of your beverage, maybe another bite of the chocolate, kind of close your eyes and think about how those flavors are kind of evolving and changing in your mouth. <clears throat> Go ahead and capture any notes that you'd like to on your tasting mat. Cleanse your palate with a little bit of water. And we'll move on to the next piece. This is our milk chocolate pecan pie. You'll see it's similar shape to the pumpkin piece, but this one is clearly not white chocolate. You'll see that beautiful light brown color on the bottom. This one has a copper colored cocoa butter uh, spray along with a little bit of spritz of yellow. When you bring this piece up to your nose again, kind of cup your hand around the piece. And now you're gonna be smelling, you know, a lot more of what you would consider a chocolate-like aroma. This is actually made with a milk chocolate, which um, starts now we've incorporated some actual cocoa solids into, into the chocolate. Get some of those roasted cocoa notes, a little bit of dairy, some milk, maybe some vanilla. I can't really smell the pecans yet. Take a bite. see the ganache on the inside. And now, first thing I taste is pecans. You get that really sweet pecan kind of nutty flavor coming in. But you're gonna notice this is melting a little slower than the last two pieces. And that's because, because we have <clears throat> actual milk chocolate in the ganache. As soon as you incorporate cocoa solids, that kind of slows the melting process down a little bit. So you're going to notice this piece melts a little slower. Got some brown sugar, some cooked or scalded milk. And the milk chocolate shell is going to kind of melt. Introduce more roasted cocoa, kind of cut some of that sweetness a little bit. Adds a little bit of like a caramelized milk milk flavor. Um, so one thing I'll say about our milk chocolate kind of makes us a little bit different. We use a process called crumb um, or crumb making or crumb oven making to actually make our milk chocolate. And what that is, when we actually blend, um, we'll talk about it in a second, but when we actually grind the cocoa beans down, we're going to separate a portion of that with some of the sugar and the milk and we're actually going to put that into a vacuum and we're going to heat it and, and, and toast it slightly. And that process kind of caramelizes some of the sugars in, in the chocolate and also in the milk and in the, um, in the milk and the, in the chocolate. And what you end up with is almost like this nice kind of like a malty, kind of like a caramel like um, aroma and flavor in, in the chocolate, which I think lends itself really nicely and kind of separates 
us um, from some of the other milk chocolates that are out there. But I really like it. I think it adds a lot of complexity to, to our um, recipes and it's something um, I hope you like as well. So with this piece, we're gonna start off by <clears throat> taking fresh roasted California pecans and we're gonna grind them into a pecan butter. So kind of like you would grind peanuts into peanut butter, we do the same thing with pecans. Um, but with peanut butter, peanut butter is a little thicker. Pecan butter is actually, because of the fat, con or the, the types of fats that are in pecan, it actually is a little more liquid. And so we're gonna take that and we're gonna make a chocolate ganache the same way as we did before. We're gonna heat up our cream, pour it over our milk chocolate, and then we're gonna pour in that pecan butter and kind of swirl that in there so it's nice and, and looks nice and has a great flavor. Then we're gonna add some brown sugar and a little bit of vanilla. <clears throat> and in the mold, so just like with the last few pieces, we're gonna use colored cocoa butter to kind of color those molds. But with these, we're gonna use copper and a little bit of that yellow um, spritz <clears throat> as well. So if you tasted that piece, you should have, you're thinking about kind of what the aftertaste is. There's a little bit of sweetness, maybe a little bit of pecan butter or pecan kind of remaining there, maybe a little vanilla. If you'd like to go ahead and take a sip of your beverage, another bite of the chocolate, kind of think about how, how those flavors are changing. With this piece, we recommend a caramel stout or a brown ale. I have a Sam Smith's Nut Brown Ale. They also make a really good um, chocolate stout as well. That's, that's very, very good. And wine, as I said, you know, really a lot of the same, same pairings there for um, milk and white chocolates, the Pinot Noir, the Brachetto, and the Chardonnay or Chenin Blanc. All right, take a sip of water. All right, now let's jump back to revisit our cocoa beans. I think those guys were kind of hanging out a little bit, enjoying themselves. So at this point, after the cocoa beans are completely dried, um, then we're going to actually sort and inspect them because we wanna make sure the beans we get um, into our factory are of the best quality. And we sort them and actually we'll take a sample and cut them in half um, using that little box there that you see. And what we're looking for is proper fermentation. So remember I mentioned that was really, really important. We're gonna actually look at the inside of the bean to see how well or how well fermented those beans are. Um, so when we cut them in half, you'll see the two beans on the left, those are actually properly fermented. You'll see a really nice even distribution of color throughout the entire bean. The beans on the right are actually under fermented. So we would reject those. They look a little bit like, like medium rare steak. You know, you've got a little bit of a red um, interior and then more of a, a darker exterior. Um, but those beans are under fermented and we would reject those. Those would not give us the characteristics and the nuances that we want in our in our chocolate. We'll let somebody else take those beans. Um, and at times it can actually be up to 30% of the beans that we have ordered. Now we don't, um, you know, we wouldn't receive those in, those would go back and we would ask for another lot of beans to inspect. Um, but once they've passed inspection or we have enough beans that we feel like we have a good, good um, amount of what we're requiring, then we're gonna bag those up and we're gonna ship those to our roasting facility in the United States. And so for us, uh, we have our Mars Roaster, which is actually in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. Um, and they take all the beans in and they're gonna roast them to our exact specifications for our FLM chocolate. Something that's really unique about FLM, um, being a part of Mars, you know, we control the process all the way through from the bean all the way to the finished box of chocolate that you have in front of you. We control every part of that process. Whereas a lot of other chocolate companies, you know, the, um, they typically aren't big enough to actually be able to make their own chocolate. So they end up buying their chocolate from big commercial chocolate companies. 
Um, and so they'll actually do that and they'll maybe change the recipe as they go a little bit um, at, their, at their facility, but um, you don't, they're not really in control of what they're getting. It's kind of like whatever they get is, is really what they get. For us, like we can control every part of that process to make sure the chocolate that we are making is, um, is the best quality possible. And so once we get those beans into the United States, into our roasting facility, then we're going to roast them. So very similar to how coffee is roasted, we're going to roast these beans. Um, you know how there's light, medium, and dark roast of coffee. So depending on the bean variety itself, um, and actually the chocolate that we're going to be making with that, with those beans, we're going to roast those to, to very specific specifications. So if we're making a lighter chocolate or a white or maybe a milk chocolate, those beans will probably not get roasted at as high of a temperature as a dark chocolate would, where we're looking for some more of those bitter notes, some of those coffee or espresso notes, um, darker, deeper, more bold flavors. <clears throat> and so I said, so once the beans are roasted, then we're going to combine them. So for our FLM chocolate, we have three different bean varieties that we use. Um, we have Brazil, Ecuador, and West Africa. We're going to blend those beans together. And now we're going to have what looks like these. So these are actually fresh roasted beans, a few different varieties in here. I'm going to pick one up and show you. So you'll see here, this is just the roasted bean. But when you flip it around, you're going to see how it's a little bit cracked. You can see it right there. There. You can see kind of this, the crack where there's the skin and then there's the inside of the bean. So in the roasting process, that kind of helps break that skin off, which we really don't, we don't want. It doesn't give us any, any value. Um, in fact, it's mostly just bitter. So we're going to take that skin off. And what's left right here in my hand, this is the nib or the shelled bean. And you'll see if I, I just picked it up and I barely touched it and it's already kind of broken in half. Oops. This bean with just a little bit of pressure is actually going to break up into little pieces or little nibs. And these are actually the building or the, the, really the purest form of chocolate. Here I have some crushed up nibs or beans. And as I said, these are really like the purest form of chocolate. Um, there is no sugar in them, so they're pretty bitter um, tasting, but they do have a beautiful, just really intense chocolate aroma and chocolate flavor. Um, and that roasting process is really what translates um, those beautiful flavors that we were generating when we fermented the beans into a chocolate-like um, aroma and flavor. So these are great. You can add them into salads or on ice cream or, you know, um, I like to I sometimes just eat them out of my out of my hand. Um, they're they're really really good, but they they really give a really nice crunch and also just that really intense chocolate flavor. Um, and so these actually are about fifty percent fat. There's about fifty percent of this nib is fat. It's locked inside of the nib. We don't really see it. Doesn't look oily. Doesn't look um, you know doesn't look wet at all. But when we grind it we're gonna to start to release some of that fat. So similar to how I said like peanut butter and um, pecan butter is made when you grind those nuts down, we do the same thing with the nibs. And we're gonna grind those down and we're gonna release that cocoa butter or the fat from the cocoa bean. And now we're gonna to start to see what looks like finished chocolate. We're gonna have this beautiful dark brown looking liquid we're gonna take that and continue to mix it. We're gonna grind it down and refine it down until it's silky smooth on our tongue. And so that takes some time. You know, it can take up to 12 hours depending on the specific recipe that, that we're making. Um, but now we're gonna add in our other ingredients, sugar, vanilla, maybe milk. It's gonna blend those all together and kind of allow excuse me, kind of allow all the, all the flavors to kind of co-mingle and kind of, kind of hang out and marinate together and kind of just get a little more well-rounded. <clears throat> and that'll take a few more hours themselves um, to kind of do that process as we're grinding everything down. And now we have our beautiful chocolate 
but it's not done yet because we have to do something called temper it in order to be able to use it in a chocolate. If we took the chocolate at this point, it would taste good, but if you tried to make a piece with it or maybe dip a strawberry or do something else with it, it would actually not really set up. It's gonna look kind of dull and have like a hazy appearance, um, you know, and that's because it needs to be tempered in order to allow that chocolate to set up beautifully and look glossy and shiny and have all those characteristics that we associate with premium chocolate. And the way that we do that is we actually control the chocolate and we heat it very carefully up to 110 degrees. And what that does is actually melts out all of the crystals in the cocoa butter. So in the chocolate itself, there are actually crystals and crystalline structures that are present. And we're actually gonna heat that chocolate up. We're gonna melt out all of the, the cocoa butter crystals. And then when we cool it, we're gonna cool it down to about 82 to 84 degrees Fahrenheit. And in that process from 110 to 82 to 84, we're actually gonna form stable cocoa butter crystals, really stable ones that we want, but then we're also gonna form ones that are not what we want. And so we've got a mix of good and bad. And to get the bad out and keep the good, we're gonna heat it back up from 82 to 84 up to 86 to 88 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's gonna melt out all those bad crystals and just leave us with the most stable, stable crystals. And at that point, the chocolate is tempered. And um, if we were to use it in a chocolate piece like our next piece here, um, it would set up and look beautiful, look glossy and shiny. It wouldn't melt in your hand. You know, it's gonna give us all of those really uh, quality, oops really um, high quality and premium characteristics that we're looking for. And at that point, once the chocolate's tempered, we can use it to mold, um, we can enrobe with it, which is a fancy term for kind of like a chocolate, um, chocolate covering or like a chocolate waterfall that covers um, something like a caramel or like a coconut center or a satin cream center um, or mold like we have with our first few pieces. We'll actually take the chocolate and the center We'll have two different hoppers with those ingredients and they kind of come down into a depositing head that's going to actually deposit in one shot the center and the shell um, and that's actually how we make the peppermint piece and also the um well the peak uh, the pecan and also the pumpkin piece as well all right so hopefully that wasn't too much information for you it kind of gives you a little bit of um a little bit of, um, about how chocolate is is made. I think it's one of these things that's really unique and, and like, you know, always thinking to myself, like, how long did it take them to actually figure out? Because like, this doesn't look or taste anything like chocolate. And not until you get to the final step does it actually start to taste like chocolate and, and you know, um, gives you that, that type of chocolate experience. So I don't know, it's one of those things I think it's really, really neat. Um, and I love, love learning about it. All right, let's jump back to our last or second to last chocolate piece, which is our dark chocolate eggnog. Now we're going to jump over to the dark side of chocolate. I was just watching The Mandalorian this morning, so I'm in a in kind of a Star Wars mood. Um, now with this piece, you're going to when you smell, I want you to really if you've got a sample of maybe one of your other pieces, smell this and then go back and maybe smell one of those. And you're gonna notice a very different aroma. Um, so now that we're using dark chocolate, we're gonna have a lot deeper, darker roasted cocoa note, almost like a coffee or like an espresso. Hopefully you're picking up on that. A little bit of vanilla maybe as well. Go ahead and take a bite. And the center is white chocolate ganache with eggnog and also some winter spices as well. First thing you should be tasting. All right. Some of that creamy ganache, those spices, maybe a little bit of warmth. We do have a little bit of bourbon and a little bit of rum in this piece because it wouldn't be eggnog without that. And then some of that eggnog, that just a little bit of like egginess, a little bit of cream. 
and then the dark chocolate's gonna melt. It's gonna kind of cut all of that and bring in a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of that coffee flavor that we were smelling. And you might even get a little bit of citrus blossom or like an orange kind of aroma or um, flavor. So this piece I mentioned before, we start off with a white chocolate ganache and we're gonna make that ganache and we're gonna add our eggnog along with a little bit of bourbon, a little bit of rum and our warm spices. So cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, a little bit of those ingredients, a little bit of softened butter we're gonna fold in at the end and that's gonna make our delicious white chocolate eggnog center. And with that, we're gonna, we're gonna shell it in dark chocolate. So it's gonna have a really nice balance of bitterness along with that sweet and kind of spicy um, eggnog center. So with this, we recommend an Irish stout like a Guinness, a Belgian style ale um, or a brown ale. <clears throat> Something like a Saison or Goose Island makes one called Sophie that I really like. <clears throat> and now with red wine, now we're getting into darker chocolates. You know, you can start to look at some other red wines. Um, Pinot Noir is still great. Chianti is another one. Uh, Lake Harvest Zinfandel actually is a nice one. It has a little bit of sweetness to it that kind of balances with that, that slight bitterness from the dark chocolate. Um, and also the Burchetto um, Diacqui works as well. Now, if you think about the aftertaste, you're probably gonna have a little bit of bitterness or a little bit of like roasted cocoa or coffee kind of remaining from that, that dark chocolate. But you'll notice that the aftertaste for dark chocolate pieces is gonna be much longer um, than the milk or the white chocolate pieces because of the amount of cocoa solids um, in the piece. Those are gonna kind of stick with us. Kind of similar to how like the tannins from a red wine will kind of stay on your tongue a little bit um, for, for a period of time after you finished uh, drinking your glass. The same kind of compounds are actually present in cocoa solids and in, in dark chocolate. So those are kind of remaining with us um, as we go. All right. Take a sip of your beverage if you'd like. Take another bite of your chocolate. And we will jump over to our final piece of the night, which is our dark chocolate creme de menthe piece right here. That's the piece in the middle. This one you'll notice has, it's in the shape of a barrel. <clears throat> and we've got a little bit of a dark chocolate um, or a green and white spritz of cocoa butter on that piece. And this one, the shell is gonna be a little bit thicker um, because of the, the alcohol that's in the center. So we wanna make sure that we balance the alcohol with the chocolate. Um, and the center of this piece actually starts out fondant sugar, which is really just a very fine granulated sugar um, or Baker's special sugar, you might find it, um, something similar to that in, in the grocery store. But it's a very fine granulation of sugar. We blend that with milk and creme de menthe liqueur and kind of mix those ingredients together till we get this beautiful, um, <clears throat> this beautiful looking center. Now we're gonna fold in a little bit of softened butter, gonna add a little bit of salt and our natural peppermint oil, which will kind of spike that mint peppermint flavor just, just a little bit. And that will get molded into the dark chocolate shell that you see here. This one I can definitely, so sometimes with dark chocolate pieces, because dark chocolate's a little more complex and has a little stronger flavor, um, you don't always smell the center um, as well. But with this one, I can definitely smell that mint kind of coming through. A little bit of like, I think I can even smell some of the alcohol as well. Take a bite, be careful. This one is a little bit liquid, so um, be careful. <laughs> Mm, you see that really beautiful creme de menthe liqueur. Right away, mint, kind of peppermint, a little bit of spearmint. 
a little bit of the warmth from the alcohol kind of coating my tongue. Dark chocolate hasn't melted yet, but it's starting to. Then it's going to kind of, kind of, kind of come in and just cut that alcohol, cut that mint really nicely. And again, it's, it's not really overpowering, but it's really just kind of sharing the stage and allowing kind of the mint to hang out in the background and then the dark chocolate kind of sharing the stage with it. Mm. A little bit of vanilla and some of that warmth from the creme de menthe liqueur. Did anybody taste any of the coffee or espresso notes in the dark chocolate? Those I think work really well with the um, with the creme de menthe and the, um, um, the alcohol in this in this piece. So with this piece, we recommend a, a vanilla stout, something like a port or or a porter. Irish stout or milk stout, you know, something a little creamier has a little bit lower alcohol um, to really, because obviously this piece has alcohol in it. We don't want to overpower our taste buds. Um, so we want something a little, little lighter there. <clears throat> Pinot Noir, again, late harvest, Zinfandel or great, or in that Brochetto de Acqui also. And this one, just like the last piece, I think you'll find that that dark chocolate um, or, or flavor is gonna kind of linger a little bit longer. So after we finished our tasting, um, you know, think about it in like 20 minutes or so and just see if you still, you know, have that um, kind of lingering in, on, on your tongue. All right. <clears throat> so at this point, I guess I would like to take any questions that anybody has, if they'd like to ask or um, comments or anything you tasted, what did you like, what did you not like? what your favorite piece was, would love to hear it. Or you can chat as well, that's fine. Hi. 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 Uh, my question was, when you were talking about the pecan pie chocolate, um, you said you used pecan butter correct am yes. i remembering yes so pecans being a lover of pecans having been raised with pecans i know that pecans can be bitter and so i was curious is that when i tasted the chocolate i did not get the bitter of the pecan is it because you use pecan butter that we don't get the bitterness that can come with pecans so there are different varieties of, of pecans but um with us i mean Yes, they can be a little bit bitter depending on the level of roast that they received. Um, or you can also get like raw or just blanched pecans, which don't normally have, have any of that, but then they're always kind of lacking on, on the flavor. So kind of having a balance of, of those two things is really important. But with this piece, because we are adding cream, you know, and we're adding spices, that's going to kind of, any bitterness that's there, it's going to kind of... Um, just kind of like round it out and, and kind of almost like covers up any, any of that while leaving just that really nice pecan flavor um, remaining. So, um, and pecans themselves are also quite, quite strong as are like hazelnuts. And so, you know, when we blend though, we're actually grinding those pecans down. We're creating a really nice pecan butter. Um, those along with the chocolate, I think, you know, really kind of kind of mute any any of those bitterness uh, or bitter notes that you might um, be tasting with just pecans. Thank you. And Mark, we got another question. What liquid is the bean fermented in? So the bean, there isn't really any, so it's just the liquid. So here, um, so those beans, you know what? I, we did a tasting a couple nights ago. I'm gonna show you something. So I've actually got some here that I, I took out. These were from now a couple days old, but I'm actually gonna ferment them myself. And if you see, like, it's hard to probably see there, but the bean, that pulp, it, it's pretty thick on the, on, the, on the fresh beans here, but after a day or two, it starts to kind of like liquefy and it kind of starts to seep and come off the, off the bean. 
And that kind of forms, uh, this hasn't had enough time yet, um, but it'll kind of pool and form a liquid. And that's, that's the liquid that they're being fermented in. Um, and so we're actually gonna be moving those beans or the farmer will move the beans every day um, to make sure they're mixing everything up and we're getting a really nice even fermentation throughout. But that liquid eventually will kind of dry off and the beans will start to turn brown um, as they continue to ferment, so. Cool. And then are you able to cut open one of those cocoa beans? I know you've done it before yeah. where it still has a pulp on it, but I would love sure. to see it cut open. So you see the center is almost like kind of purpley, kind of purple white. So this is obviously not, not fermented at all, but um, you kind of see those purple. The purple in here is actually, um, so when they kind of, when they talk about like chocolate being healthy or some of the health benefits like heart, cardiovascular, those are coming from the flavanols or cocoa polyphenols that are in, in cocoa. And a lot of them are actually in that, the, the, the purple that actual purple that you're seeing there in its raw form. Cool. Is there any other yeah, questions? I know you guys aren't here, but if I smell it, if I smell, so these beans have been just in this bag now for about a day or a day or two. Um, I'm, it, they smell almost kind of like, like, like bread, like very like yeasty, has like that, um, kind of baked bread or rising dough kind of aroma to it. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, but it's basically just the yeasts in the air and that are um, kind of starting that fermentation along with the, the sugar that's in the pulp to kind of start start kind of generating. Just like you can create your own starter for, for bread and sourdough uh, in your own kitchen. Um, doing kind of the same thing, same thing here. What are you going to do with them after they're fermented? Are you going to make your own chocolate? Yeah, so I'll take these um, and actually, well, kind of dry them myself. So being in Vegas, it's, we're very, very dry, low humidity. So those will dry really quickly. Um, then I'll just probably roast them in my oven here. Um, you know, typically, I would say not more than like 150 degrees. You want to roast them um, pretty low at first and then at the very end, bring the temperature up. Um, because you don't want to burn them. They're, uh, they're, that's definitely a smell that you don't want to have in your kitchen is, is burnt, just kind of like burnt chocolate doesn't smell very good. Burnt cocoa beans don't either. Um, but yeah, about 120 degrees or so uh, for, for 10 to 15 minutes and we'll have a really nice kind of toasted cocoa bean. Cool. And then I think the last question we have is what other liqueur filled pieces do we have? Someone said sure. they thought so, were kind of more complex, so. Yeah, sure. So the creme de menthe is exclusive for holiday, but we also have a um, dark chocolate Grand Marnier, dark chocolate Knob Creek bourbon, dark chocolate Bailey's Irish cream. We have a milk chocolate amaretto, milk chocolate Myers rum, and a, I'm missing one. Oh, dark chocolate uh, Herradura tequila, Añejo, Herradura and Añejo tequila. Um, and those are more liqueur based, so similar to the, the creme de menthe that we tried. But we also have one of my favorite pieces is our dark chocolate um, XO cognac truffle. So XO means extra old. It's actually the oldest um, classification or the uh, most aged classification of, of cognac. So we use Remy Martin XO cognac um, in actual, the, in, in the chocolate ganache. And so we make a beautiful truffle. Um, with with that so it is also contains alcohol but it's not necessarily a, a liqueur piece awesome well i do just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight we have a discount code for you all i saw someone ask about a all of our liqueur pieces so we do have a liqueur box collection you guys didn't see my ugly sweater but i do have an ugly sweater on you can see <laughs> um, if you want to order anything off our website Use code virtual at checkout and that will get you 15% off throughout up until um, the end of the weekend. If you want to do any more last minute holiday shopping, now is the time we are still taking orders for delivery by Christmas. So it is a perfect time to order your last minute gifts. And then if you want to do another virtual tasting, we have another one coming up on New Year's Eve. Mark will be there, I'll be there. We'll be celebrating New Year's Eve with our truffle collection. And that is on sale now at ethelum.com as well. So if you wanna go ahead and get that and celebrate New Year's Eve at home with our truffles, that is a perfect way to do it. 
I hope I see you all next time, and I hope you all enjoyed the tasting. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a great night.